Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the first one in the series where we'll be looking at material from Rollo May's book, The Discovery of Being. Okay, so I wanted to have this be the first book-oriented uh, lecture for you because I wanted right in the beginning for you to be thinking about the interrelationship between existential philosophical thought and its application to the project of psychology. And this book is exactly about that project. So uh, Rollo May, he's uh, the only author in this entire semester who is American, so he's one of ours. And uh, because you students are always panting and slavering like wild wolves for your next reading assignment, there it is in your notes. So uh, it's the section entitled The Cultural Background from pages 37 to 88. So skip the first couple chapters, start on 37 and go to 88. And this video and possibly part of the next one will ride right in parallel with your reading assignment. But first, let's get the crazy professorial hair a little bit under control with a hat. Okay, so you're probably getting used to these hats. And there you go. Looking good. <laughs> All right, so um, main theme. Okay, so uh, existentialism's historical emergence, especially in the 19th century. Okay, so this is going to map onto material from chapter four in your reading assignment. And what you have to do uh, for this part is to remember, hopefully, what you know about uh, the 19th century and the history of the 19th century, especially in the West. And uh, if you know one thing about that, probably it would be the idea that, well, you know, uh, that's when we were seeing the upsurge of the Industrial Revolution with inventions like, uh, you know, the cotton gin and uh, uh, the steam engine and things like that. Uh, and the Industrial Revolution, of course, really took off in the uh, first half of the 20th century, but it was definitely gaining steam, as it were. Dad joke, okay, got my dad joke t-shirt on here. So it was definitely gaining steam uh, during the 19th century. And, and that's exactly the period when uh, existential thinking was not at its peak, but also gaining steam. So the question is, what did the Industrial Revolution and the reality of that word, world have to do with the advent of something like existential thinking? So that's what he's talking about in the beginning of this chapter. So his way of talking about it is uh, in the 19th century, like think of the Victorian era. Victoria, as if memory serves, Queen Victoria's reign ended in 1901. So think of the Victorian era, which lasted quite a long time. She was one of the, the oldest, uh, oldest reigns, I think, in the British Empire maybe the second oldest, but at any rate, there was a lot of compartmentalization going on, is what Rollo May talks about. What is compartmentalization? Well, it's a way of separating and putting in neat little categories basic elements of our lives. Well, what are those basic elements? Well, uh, he notes three. Uh, reason, our capacity to uh, think rationally, okay? Uh, will and willpower, the capacity to make decisions and choices, and then the emotions. Okay, so a way of thinking about what we are that sort of separates those things out, but it's not just a matter of separating those things out. In the process, uh, there was a kind of promotion, especially of our capacities for reason, you know, and, uh, you know, that's maybe obvious, like when you think about uh, the advent of the Industrial Revolution and how much reason and scientific knowledge it took to generate an industrial revolution. So there's this promotion of the element of reason and a corresponding demotion of the emotions and the passions. Okay, so this is part of what Rollo May says, uh, made real fertile ground for a movement like existentialism that would seek to rebalance the scales, as it were, between reason on one side and the emotions and passions on the other side. Okay, so um, if, you're, uh, if you doubt that uh, the, the latter half of the 19th century or the Victorian era 
uh, had a kind of demotion of the emotions going on, well, think of some of the literature perhaps that you've read that comes from that era. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I read uh, 19th century literature, uh, very often there will be a, uh, you know, when they come to uh, describing scenes of being sort of a, uh, turned on by a woman, most of, the t most of the authors, 90 plus percent of the authors are male, and they'll be writing a scene about being sort of sexually uh, turned on or aroused by a woman. And uh, usually the way it works <laughs> is um, in these uh, 19th century novels is, you know, this guy will uh, catch sight of a woman's ankle under her petticoats or something like that, and he'll be rhapsodizing for 40 or 50 pages about this damn ankle, and well, I did catch sight of the ankle, and uh, I did catch sight, moreover, of the ankle bone, and the ankle bone was as white and brilliant as alabaster, and, uh, and, and you know, 40 pages later, and he's still rhapsodizing about the ankle, and I always wondered what, what would happen to one of these 19th century guys when he sort of got the whole package, you know, like, would he erupt in flames? Would he spontaneously combust? But at any rate, that's, um, if you can sort of follow that, uh, that's a marker of a kind of repression of, well, not just the emotions, but more specifically the sexual uh, appetites, you know, the carnal appetites and uh, the kind of emotionality and passion that goes along with that. It's probably not surprising that uh, soon after that, along came Sigmund Freud, who evolved the whole theory of psychology largely based around uh, the repression of our sexual impulses and appetites and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, the other thing going on during the Industrial Revolution, and maybe this is more evident in early 20th century Industrial Evolution, was uh, the idea that um, human beings uh, began to be treated as a kind of machine. It's sort of like the, the, um, the movement from the apprentice and handcrafted age, where products are handcrafted one by one by skilled craftsmen and their apprentices, a movement from that paradigm to mass production paradigm. Like, and probably in my mind, there's no image more emblematic of that than the image of Model Ts being produced. And I realized that that was early 20th century and not 19. But, like. Um, follow the logic, okay, you know, like those Model Ts, and, you know, like, can you imagine, like, those people, and this was before unions and and forces like that had mandated an eight-hour workday, so imagine uh, sitting there maybe 10 or 12 hours per day, turning the same bolt all day long as one Model T passed in front of you and then the other, and what Rollo May talks about in this regard is that Along with the Industrial Revolution and all the wonderful benefits of the Industrial Revolution, which, by the way, were many, came a kind of dehumanizing of a lot of workers and a way of treating them as though they themselves were machines and uh, viewing them in terms of being, in a sense, resources to be consumed. You know, like in our modern era, it's pretty common to talk about human resources, like an HR department or something like that, like human resources. And isn't that sort of an odd turn of phrase when you think about it? Because, you know, you might have the idea that there's more to being a human being than being a resource, or even more to being a human being in the work environment than simply being a resource. But uh, here we have it with those linguistic conventions. So this way of, uh, okay, so let's connect the dots for a second. So in the 19th century, probably early 20th century too, basically the emergence of existentialism riding right alongside the Industrial Revolution. That Industrial Revolution, according to his analysis, provided really fertile ground for a movement like existentialism, which would seek to, to uh, rebalance the scales first between uh, reason and the emotions. So uh, existentialists usually are pretty quick to value and valorize the emotions and the passions and even the sexual uh, appetites and stuff like that uh, to, to rebalance the scales there so that both reason and the emotions and our willpower too can play vital roles in our life without this sort of lopsided uh, in the South, we say caddy wampus. It was sort of like conceptually caddy wampus, you know, to uh, compartmentalize uh, reason as opposed to the emotions in this particular imbalanced way. 
So you learn a little bit of possibly southern vocabulary here in addition to everything else. Okay, so that provided real fertile ground and the other thing that provided real fertile ground was the dehumanizing effects of the Industrial Revolution. So here existentialism is going to be an attempt to sort of re reassert the primacy of our humanity and our experience as human beings and refocus our attention at least partially on exploring being such that we end up being human beings. Okay. All right, so that's sort of the large historical trajectory he talks about in this chapter, but he also talks about uh, the emergence in the United States of existential psychology right around 1960. Yeah, you can argue that it was going on in the 1950s and all that, but probably not a bad target date in the United States. As I said, I think in the previous video, the getting started video uh, was kind of a roundish 1960, let's put it that way. And he, uh, he outlines the emergence of existential psychology in the U.S. in terms of three resistances to it. Okay, so here's the deal about psychology at that point in time, especially American psychology, that was dominated by two overarching forces for sure. And one of them had to do with behaviorism. Okay, so classical, old school, pure behaviorism, all right, and the other of which had to do with psychoanalysis. So that's uh, Freud and the people who followed in Freud's train, such as the psychodynamic thinkers and people like that. So those were the two huge forces at play up to that point within American psychology. So uh, there was a lot of resistance is the point to um, a movement like existential psychology at that point in time. So what are the major resistances? Well, I already told you that there are going to be three of them. So first one, and here's how he says it in the book. The first resistance within American psychology to existential thinking, okay, is the assumption that all major discoveries have already been made in psychology and that therefore we don't need to be inquiring as to the nature of existence or being or any constructs like that in order to reformulate psychology's basis in any sort of fundamental way. And by the way, if uh, you uh, don't know what existence is about from this perspective, buy a dictionary and look up the word, okay? <laughs> you know, from this perspective. Because really, uh, sort of the idea is that, you know, psychology is resistant to taking an existential approach because it thinks it already has the fundamental paradigm. Like all the, all the most basic realizations have already been made and psychology's project is just a matter of sort of fleshing out the details as it were. So we don't really need to ask any of these radical fundamental questions about the nature of being from that point of view. So they don't wanna, they sort of don't wanna go there in essence because of that. Like they wanna think that uh, they already have the template and it's just a matter of sort of turning the crank far enough and then you'll be able to fulfill the project of psychology. Okay, second resistance. Uh, existential analysis is an encroachment of philosophy into psychiatry or psychology and does not have much to do with science. Okay, so this is sort of a turf war complaint. All right, so uh, the complaint is that, well, you know, existential psychology is a way of introducing a philosophical element into the project of psychology, but the project of psychology is, uh, for the most part, defined as a kind of science. <laughs> okay, so the, the, um, the science of behavior, <laughs> probably more specifically in cognitive processes and things like that. So uh, it's an unwarranted uh, intrusion might be a way of saying it. And uh, here's the thing about that. That may strike you as like odd, uh, but the academic world is a lot of the times uh, structured in, ter in terms of sort of turf war. And uh, you know, it's sort of like, a, like gang territory. It's sort of like you're wearing the wrong colors or something like that. And if, and if uh, you're in the wrong territory and wearing the wrong colors, you're going to get dissed in an academic way, you know. Except, uh, you know, we academicians will never use a short word like dissed when a nice, long, fancy word like uh, you will be repudiated <laughs> uh, will do. Okay, so uh, existential analysis is an encroachment of philosophy into psychology. doesn't have much to do with the science. But here's the rejoinder to that. Um, <laughs> the thing is that... 
uh, insofar as science is unwilling to inquire into the nature of existence, in a way it's being anti-scientific. And the reason why is because the animating spirit of science is to subject everything to questioning, not just assume you already know the answer or assume that the dictionary has an adequate definition for a term as fundamental as existence. I mean, in a way, that directly contradicts the animating spirit of science. So the existential rejoinder is, why are we so damn resistant? to asking about the nature of existence, because a fundamental question like that, you would think, would be of interest to science, because in a way, the entire edifice of scientific inquiry is implicitly built on it. So it seems strange that if the animating spirit of science is to subject everything to questioning, that they're unwilling to subject that root fundamental construct to <laughs> a similar kind of questioning. All right, so, and then number three, Third resistance. Okay, let's remind ourselves what we're talking about. We're talking about why is it that American psychology historically has been so resistant to taking an existential approach? So, nine, number three, the tendency in this country uh, to be preoccupied with technique and practical results. Okay, so in one of your previous videos, I think it might have been getting started video number four, possibly, I went on sort of a long rant about um, how it is that if you make sort of doing and productivity and accomplishment the be-all, end-all of your life, that you will never really lay claim to sort of the deeper latencies of your human birthright, because the deeper latencies of your human birthright have to do with things like, what is your life about, really? Questions like that. What is your existence about? What is the nature of your being? So um, what will end up happening to you if you do that is you'll end up being a kind of robot, like a kind of a very productive robot in your life. You'll have a basically robotic sort of relation to <laughs> what you're experiencing here in human form. And that as a consequence, you know, part of you will always remain sort of unfulfilled. And not just part of you remain unfulfilled, but in a way the deeper part of you, the part that would sort of relate to life itself, would be able to fathom in a way something important about your existential condition. All of that will go by the wayside if all you ever do is be productive your every damn minute of your life. Okay, I'm being commanded by the robotic machine that probably doesn't think much about being in order to, <laughs> I'm being commanded to restart my computer so I have to say no. Uh, that might be a little bit of a metaphor for what we're talking about now. At some point you have to say no to being just productive all the damn time. You know, you have to make space for your life, man. You have to make space for your heartbeat. You have to make space for the music and poetry of human existence. Like at some point, assuming you really want to be alive, you know, if you're content with being sort of a, a more or less a glorified robot, well, okay, if that's your kink, you go for it. But uh, for some of us, it's not enough. So uh, here's how I said it in your notes. The overemphasizing technique and practical results without a connection to the basic reality of existence easily eventuates in an endless robotic, quote, doing at the expense of the part of our human birthright that rests in realizing our being. Too much doing, not enough being. They need to be in balance. They need to be in balance, okay? So, at this point, Rollo May asks a pretty basic question, and the basic question is, what is existentialism? Oh my goodness, thank goodness you have just watched five videos in the Getting Started series on exactly that question. So hopefully this treatment is going to be really easy for you to absorb. In any case, here's what he says. Existentialism, in short, is the endeavor to understand man by cutting below the cleavage between subject and object, which has bedeviled Western thought and science since shortly after the Renaissance. That's on page 49, early in your reading assignment. Okay, so a little uh, early enlightenment. Okay, the sort of early enlightenment period emphasis on, you know, there's subjectivity and objectivity. Like Rene Descartes was one of the most famous people. Uh, he was a philosopher who lived from 1596 to 1650, yes, uh, French philosopher who had a, a way of talking about this in terms of uh, 
well, I'd give you the Latin that he wrote in, but that's probably a little bit too esoteric for this class. Uh, subjectivity and objectivity, let's say it that way. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, early enlightenment. Existentialism is an attitude which accepts man as always becoming, which means potentially in crisis. Okay, so, and at first that may seem like a little bit of sort of harsh sermonizing in a way, but here's a, here's a thing. This, this is a uh, sort of a, what is this? A sort of a adage or something that comes to us by way of um, Chinese uh, ideographs. Supposedly the Chinese ideographs for the word crisis are also uh, the ideographs are part of them for the word opportunity. <laughs> okay, so you know, what you think of as a crisis might also be in a kind of opportunity. Anyhow, I thought uh, that this quote, he's here at this point, page 57, uh, Rollo May is quoting uh, Blaise Pascal, whom I quoted uh, in a couple times, I think, in your Getting Started videos, but this is a different quote. But this is just beautifully, I think, emblematic of, uh, you know, the existential sensibility. Uh, come to us by way of uh, an Enlightenment thinker, Pascal. When I consider the brief span of my life swallowed up in the eternity before and behind it, the small space that I fill or even see, engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces which I know not and which know not me, I am afraid and wonder to see myself here rather than there, for there is no reason why I should be here rather than there, now rather than then. Uh, uh, I don't know about you. To me, that's like a, a beautiful rendering, pre-existential rendering of uh, what I would think of as an existential sensibility, or at least part of an existential sensibility. Okay, let's see where we are in your notes. Um, uh, la, 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 la. I'm not sure how long this is going on. I should have timed it. Uh, at any rate, since I'm not sure how long this is going on, I have a sense that it might be long enough. Uh, let's put an end to this video and, uh, should we put an end to this video now? Yeah, okay. Let's put an end to this video now. And, uh, we'll connect back up in video number two in this series. So you can look forward to that or dread that as the case may be. In any case, have a good one. Take care.